An important objective of labor law is to ensure fairness in negotiations between employers and workers. For this, labor law protects the ability of workers to negotiate as a group and sets minimum standards for the various aspects of work. Hello and welcome back to the second module of this course on decent work for women. Along with setting out minimum standards for work, labor law also prohibits some exploitative aspects of the employment relationship. In this video, we will learn about these prohibitions. The Constitution of India expressly prohibits bonded labor and the employment of children under the age of 14 in any factory, mine, or other hazardous activity. The Bonded Labor System Abolition Act of 1976 abolishes systems of forced or partly forced labor and sets out punishments for those committing or those abetting the commission of these acts. Article 23 of the Constitution of India prohibits traffic in human beings and begar and other similar forms of forced labor. Article 24 of the Indian Constitution provides that no child who is less than 14 years of age should be employed in any hazardous industries. The Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act of 1986 completely prohibits the employment of children who are less than 14 years of age, except if employed in a family business and her education is not hampered. Those between 14 and 18 years of age are prohibited to take employment in a list of hazardous occupations. The Minimum Age Convention of 1973, which is Convention 138 of the ILO, requires ratifying states to pursue a national policy designed to ensure the effective abolition of child labour and to raise progressively the minimum age for admission to employment or work. Countries are free to specify a minimum age for labour with a minimum of 15 years but 14 years is also possible for a specified period of time. The minimum age of 18 years is specified for work which is likely to jeopardize the health, safety or morals of young persons. The Worst Forms of Child Labour Convention 1999, which is ILO Convention No. 182, identifies some forms of child labour as the worst, including all forms of slavery such as trafficking and debt bondage, and forced or compulsory labour, and prostitution and pornography. It also requires countries to identify work that is likely to harm the health, safety or morals of children as the worst forms of child labour. The Convention obliges member nations to prohibit all such worst forms of child labour. Both of these are fundamental conventions and India has ratified them. The Forced Labour Convention of 1930, which is Convention 29 of the ILO, was aimed at the colonial governments of the time and placed restrictions on who can be required to provide forced labour or compulsory labour, working hours and remuneration. It defines forced labour as all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily. Ratifying countries must ensure that the illegal extraction of forced or compulsory labour is punishable by law and that penalties are adequate and strictly enforced and they are required to report annually on the measures that they have taken to give effect to the provisions in the Convention. The Abolition of Forced Labour Convention 1957, which is Convention 105 of the ILO, requires ratifying states to immediately abolish any form of forced or compulsory labour as a means of political coercion or education, or as a means of punishment for holding or expressing political views, as a method of mobilizing and using labour for the purposes of economic development, as a means of labour discipline, or having participated in strikes, and as a means of racial, social, national, or religious discrimination. The 2014 Protocol to the Forced Labour Convention requires member states to take effective measures to prevent and eliminate forced or compulsory labour, to provide protection to victims and access to appropriate and effective remedies such as compensation and to sanction the perpetrators of forced or compulsory labour. Then there's the question of deprivation of liberty. I mentioned how workers in these dormitories are not allowed to leave, were not allowed to leave during the lockdowns. <coughs> They are forced to come to the factory at any time that the management calls them. They're not allowed to move on their own in a, in, in a way that you and I can move or any worker anywhere else can move. Other than completely prohibiting forced or compulsory labor, labor laws also prohibit violence at work, including gendered violence and harassment. 
India does not have a special law to deal with physical and psychological harm at work. Workers, however, can file complaints with the police under the ordinary criminal law. Under the Violence and Harassment Convention of 2019, which is Convention No. 190 of the ILO, ratifying states are required to develop national laws prohibiting workplace violence and to take preventive measures, such as information campaigns, and require companies to have workplace policies on violence. It also obligates governments to monitor the issue and provide access to remedies through complaint mechanisms, witness protection measures, and victim services, and to provide measures to protect victims and whistleblowers from retaliation. India has not ratified this convention. India does, however, have a specific law to deal with gendered violence and harassment at work. The Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace, Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act of 2013 places a duty on employers to establish and maintain a complaints mechanism to investigate and redress complaints of sexual harassment by any aggrieved woman. The third major issue is really that of gender-based violence and harassment. Okay. This has recently come into a lot of attention. Two years ago, I think it was in 2018 or 17, that the ILO held a conference they have an annual conference. The annual conference was on the question of gender-based violence and harassment at the workplace. And they then adopted a convention on this. They didn't have one till two years ago. Now they do have a convention. I don't think the government of India has, has yet ratified that convention. But it's important to understand the nature and extent of this violence at the workplace. We're not talking about domestic violence. We're talking now. We're talking about violence in public spaces, like the Nirbhaya case and those which we know. We're talking about violence at the workplace. Yeah. So the workplace violence. There are a number of forms of this violence, and some of them are some main, mainly they are first causing physical harm. For instance, you know, throwing heavy bundles of paper or clothes or scissors or other projectiles. This is a kind of physical harm that is caused. You'll often see this happening in garment factories, pushing them, pushing the workers, beating them. So this is physical harm, one. The second is mental harm. If you go to a garment factory, you'll be surprised at the amount of verbal abuse that goes on. Verbal abuse with all the usual sexual connotations. So it's not just cursing somebody, cursing the workers, but cursing them in a sexual manner, which particularly is aimed at the women. So that is the second, leads to public humiliation. Now, women of course suffer this much more than men do. Lower caste women will also suffer it more than the uh, upper caste women do. So they are abused in so many ways. In fact, often they are forced to leave through this abuse. I remember garment workers in Bangalore telling me that when they face this kind of sexual harassment and abuse, they, they themselves leave a factory. Now, how often, how often can you keep leaving a factory? There's still only a limited number of factories. So they have to leave because they just can't stand that humiliation of having gone through this abuse and staying back and continuing to remain in that factory. The third one, sexual harm or assault, this can again happen, not only management sometimes, but also the supervisors, sometimes also co-workers. In inappropriate touching, the women will tell you that how the supervisor comes and puts his arms around them and tries to tell them, supposedly showing them how to do something, and in that way touches them here and there where they don't want it. And they can say nothing about it. They say, what do we do? We lose our jobs if we try to protest because the supervisors are often also the contractors. They're the ones who brought them from their homes to get them work in the factories. The supervisors are paid money to bring these workers as contractors. And they had, so they, they, there's a double relationship. They're both supervisors and contractors. And so they can very easily lose their jobs if they try to protest against this. Then there is the, therefore, the next form of violence, which is that of coercion or threats and retaliation. If you complain, action will be taken. There have been action, there have been instances where the complaints have been taken up, have, have been lodged, 
but action has been taken against the workers or they're threatened with action. I've heard managers say that, you know, what can we do? This is the only way we can get work done is by abusing. I'll come back to this again, how important this abuse is as a form of management. So there are these main forms of gender-based violence and harassment. What are they? The first one is physical harm. The second is mental harm. The third is sexual harm or suffering. The fourth is coercion with threats or of retaliation. And the fifth is deprivation of liberty. Now, these are forms of gender-based violence, but is there a connection between this gender-based violence and the way work is supervised in the garment factories? This is often not looked into, but we have tried to look into this. And we have seen, as I mentioned a little earlier, there's actually a close connection between this gender-based violence and harassment and the form of supervision in garment factories, which is an abusive supervision. It is not a kind of teamwork, but it is really abusive. As I mentioned here earlier, managers have told me that, you know, what can we do if the supervisors don't curse the women or the workers, they won't work. They don't keep that pace of work. It's only through threatening them, cursing them, then we can get the work done. So what does that mean? This is the form in which work is supervised in the garment factory through abuse. Therefore, we need to be able to make a change in the way that work is structured if we are to be able to end uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence and abuse in the garment factory. Previously in this course, we learned about how work and employment relationships operate in an environment of patriarchy and gender inequality. We saw how that affects the types of work that are available to women and how it contributes to precarity and low wages. Earlier in this module, we learned how labor law addresses disparity in wages between men and women. Let us now learn about how labor law addresses discrimination more broadly. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, 1979, is not an ILO convention. By accepting the convention, states commit to undertake a series of measures to end discrimination against women in all forms, including to incorporate the principle of equality of men and women in their legal system, abolish all discriminatory laws and adopt appropriate ones prohibiting discrimination against women, to establish tribunals and other public institutions to ensure the effective protection of women against discrimination, and to ensure elimination of all acts of discrimination against women by persons, organizations, or enterprises. India has ratified the CEDAW. In India, not only does the state have an obligation to ensure that equal work is paid equally and without discrimination, the state also has to take steps to dismantle structures and practices that have contributed to the unequal and discriminatory treatment of workers. Everyone has a fundamental right under Article 14 to equality before the law and equal protection of laws. Article 15 prohibits the state from discriminating against citizens on the grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. It also empowers the state to make special provision for special groups of people, such as women, children, the scheduled castes, and the scheduled tribes. Article 16 promises equality of opportunity for all citizens in matters relating to public employment. India, however, does not have a special law to address discrimination at private sector workplaces. However, apart from addressing discrimination on the question of wages as we have learned previously, the Equal Remuneration Act mandates that there should be no discrimination against women in matters of recruitment. In the Industrial Disputes Act, the list of prohibited unfair labor practices include 1. Discrimination against any worker for filing charges or testifying against an employer in any inquiry or proceeding relating to any industrial dispute and 2. Showing favoritism. The Discrimination, Employment and Occupation Convention of 1958, which is Convention 111, defines discrimination to include any distinction, exclusion, or preference made on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, political opinion, national extraction or social origin, which has the effect of nullifying or impairing equality of opportunity or treatment in employment or occupation. The Convention requires ratifying states to pursue a national policy designed to promote equality of opportunity and treatment in employment and occupation. 
The terms employment and occupation include access to vocational training, access to employment and particular occupations and terms and conditions of employment. India has ratified this convention. Article 1 of the Declaration on Equality of Opportunity and Treatment for Women Workers, which is a resolution of the International Labour Conference and not a convention, states that there shall be equality of opportunity and treatment for all workers. All forms of discrimination on the grounds of sex, which deny or restrict such equality, must be eliminated. We have learned how the Indian constitution pursues a policy of substantive equality. The obligation on the state under the constitution is not to treat people neutrally, but to consider discrimination, marginalization and unequal distribution to achieve equality of outcomes. As we learned in the first module of this course, the most important reason for the unequal position of men and women at work is that women bear the substantially greater burden of unpaid care work. The constitution requires the Indian state to recognize this and take some steps to correct that discrimination. India, however, does not have any special law that addresses this systemic factor in the discrimination faced by women at work. Article 3 of the Workers with Family Responsibilities Convention of 1981, which is Convention 156 of the ILO, requires ratifying states to make national policy to enable persons with family responsibilities to work without being subject to discrimination. The convention requires governments to take into account the needs of workers with family responsibilities and community planning and to develop or promote community services, public or private, such as childcare and family services and facilities. India has not ratified this convention. In this video, we learned about how labor law, through India's national law and through international standards, addresses exploitative work, gender-based violence and harassment, and discrimination. That completes our module on the law and standards that regulate work. You learned how labor law sets minimum standards for various aspects of work to make the employment relationship fairer. You also learned, however, that many of these standards are not realized in workplaces, particularly in informal work in which a substantial number of women are employed. We also reflected on some of the structural barriers that women workers may face in raising any claims under these laws. That brings us now to the question of how we can realize these standards for women at all workplaces. That is the subject of the next module of this course. Thank you for watching. Thank you.